Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. In today's uh, broadcast, we begin in Psalm number 40, beginning in verse number 1. So if you have your Bible, open it up to Psalm 40, verse 1. We went through Psalm 40, verse 3 last time, but I want to back up and begin reading at the beginning of this psalm. While you're getting your Bible, that always gives me an opportunity to tell you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. My desire is to teach the Word of God. My desire is to see as many souls saved as possible, as many Christians sanctified, made made holy, made like Jesus as possible. And there's only one way that that can happen. It starts with the Word of God, and the Word of God must be proclaimed clearly. If it's not, people may be entertained, they may be tickled, they may be impressed with the intellect of the preacher or the Bible teacher or the pastor, but nothing good is going to come out of that. Nothing that glorifies Jesus comes out of that. This is not a variety. Scripture verse by verse is not a variety show, okay? This is not entertainment. This is not a variety show. This is the Word of God, verse by verse. And you can study it in its entirety at your pace, at your convenience, at thebibleversebyverse.com. But for now, let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 40, beginning in verse 1. I, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined unto me and heard my cry. And of course, you don't, you don't have to wait for God to hear your prayer. Because before you even speak it, before it even leaves your lips, God knows what you're going to say. And so he hears you immediately. As long as there aren't any unconfessed sins in your life, as a Christian, he hears you immediately, if not before. What we have to wait for sometime is God's answer. And it is during that interval between the time that you pray and he hears and the time that he answers, that's when you have to wait on the Lord in the sense of continue with him, continue living for him, continue to worship him, continue to pray, continue to study, continue to read his word. And so it says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. It it took a while, evidently. It took longer than what he wanted to wait, but David eventually got his answer from God. God came through for him and delivered him. Out of the miry pit. And you know what the miry pit is, among other things? Sin. Sin is a miry pit. Sin is like spiritual sludge that causes us to struggle through this life. Yes, even Christians. Jesus lifts our feet out of that muck and makes life easier for us to handle. It isn't perfect. And it isn't always fun and games, but it's a lot better to go through life on solid ground with Jesus Christ than to plod through the sludge of sin as the unsaved do. And as some Christians do. Or I I shouldn't call them Christians because I've got my doubts. And you should too. Professing Christians. Why trod through the sludge of sin in your life When you can get sold out to Jesus Christ, on fire for Jesus Christ, no unconfessed sins in your life, no sins that you're aware of, and go through life, sailing through life with Jesus Christ, leading you every step of the way. Verse 3, And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Notice. Let's read that again. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and trust in the Lord. When Christians live for God and talk to God and worship God, 
like he is real, that brings conviction on sinners who don't know God. No one repents unless they fear the Lord God. And they won't fear God unless they come in contact with a Christian whose walk is so close to God that it makes them think, hey, they talk to Jesus as if he's a real person. It makes them come face to face with the reality of their own sinfulness. I know what I'm talking about. I had this experience back 38 years ago. I was brought up in a religious home. My mom went to church all the time. Didn't do me one bit of good. I didn't know the Lord. I had some religion. I prayed some prayers. But I didn't know the Lord. I, I never repented and received Christ as Lord and Savior. I remember I went to this church where the people there were talking to Jesus in their prayer. Like he was alive. I mean, it was spontaneous. And they were praising spontaneously and, and talking to Jesus. And the preacher preached the word of God with conviction and I was brought face to face with the reality that Jesus Christ is alive and well, and I needed to do something about it. Either thumbs up or thumbs down, but I needed to do something. But the fact is, I had a fear of God when I was in the presence of these people who took God seriously. You see, if you water down the word of God and you live a lukewarm existence as a professing Christian, you're not going to do Jesus any good at all. You may get ungodly people to think you're cool, but you're not going to do them any favors, spiritually speaking. You think you're going to save them from hell? You can get them to join your church if it's cool enough without them ever repenting. And goodness knows you would never tell them to repent. You get them to join your group. You get them to come to your so-called Bible study. You get them to come to your concert. You get them to come to your, to your dinner, to your picnic, to all sorts of stuff. And get them coming and get them giving. And you can even deceive them into thinking that they are a Christian, but they're no more of a Christian than you are. And what have you accomplished? Not a single thing. Not if you don't live for Jesus. Because holiness is the issue. Sin is the issue, and you don't know that you're a sinner. A person doesn't know that they're a sinner until they come face to face with holiness. And that is why Peter in the boat, in the boat when Jesus calmed the storm, he said, oh, no, no. It was when he, he told Peter and the uh, other fishermen to cast their net over the side, even after they had been fishing all night, didn't get anything, and they pulled in a net full. Peter knew he was standing in the presence of deity, of holiness. He said, depart from me. For I'm a sinful man. See, holiness produces a fear of God. And that fear of God will either lead you to repent or to ignore it, depending on whether you have a heart for God or not. But the least that we can do as Christians, the least that we can do for Jesus as Christians, is live that holy life and speak the truth. If you're not doing that, you're worthless, absolutely worthless to Jesus Christ. No wonder he says he's going to vomit you out of his mouth. You make him sick. Because you misrepresent him. Calling yourself a Christian and living like the devil. Or, or maybe not like the devil. Just like one of the demons. Okay, kind of middle of the road. Nah. Their demons are, are evil too. But kind of, kind of you know, not quite as bad as Satan. You still talk the talk. You ain't doing God no good. At, you ain't doing God any good. You ain't doing Jesus any good. You're not doing a lost sinner any good. You're not even doing yourself any good. You're playing some stupid evangelical game that isn't going to get you to first base after you die. You're going to be called out, called third strike, and into hell you go. And rightly so, for not only not being used by God, but by misrepresenting the name of Jesus. And the churches are full of people like that today. Not all of them. No, I know that. But a lot of them. So when Christians live for God, 
and talk to God and worship God like he's real, that brings conviction on sinners who don't know God. Verse 4. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. In other words, you are much better off putting your trust in God rather than the things that this world can offer, or even in people, or money. You are much better putting your trust in God than anything of this world. Now, God may use things, or God may use people to bless you, but it's not right to trust the blessing or the people that he uses. Trust the blesser. Put your focus and faith in God. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust, verse 4 says, and, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. 5. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are directed toward us, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. Isn't that an amazing verse? You could spend your entire life investigating and discovering nature and science, and you wouldn't even begin to discover, you wouldn't even begin to discover all the things that God has done, that God has made. And certainly you wouldn't even begin to scratch the surface on how it's all put together and how it all functions. A lifetime of study won't even get you close. Because the Bible says, Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. And then the last part of this verse, I love it. And thy thoughts which are directed toward us, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I, if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Do you know that God thinks about you more than you think about him? God has more thoughts about you and I than the total number of thoughts that we have in our lifetime. If you could calculate all the thoughts that you have about any subject, anything, in your entire lifetime, they wouldn't even come close to the amount of thoughts that God has toward you. Always, all the time. God is always thinking about us. He thinks about us. He thinks about what we say. He thinks about what we do. He thinks about what we want to do. He thinks about what we are sorry that we did do. He thinks about our regrets. He thinks about our desires. He thinks about our hopes. He thinks about our prayer request. He thinks about our longings. God thinks about our thoughts. In spite of all of our sins, God treats us as if we are very special. I mean, just the way he thinks about us all the time proves that. Verse 6, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. My ears you have opened. You say, what in the world does that mean? That's not talking about wax removal. That's not talking about a hearing aid. It's talking about pierced ears. When a Hebrew, back in Old Testament days, wanted to become a lifelong servant of another Hebrew, he would have that would-be Hebrew master pierce his ear and wear his master's earring. His pierced ear symbolized his complete dedication for a lifetime to his master. It was willing, it was complete, it was total, it was forever. So with that in mind, Notice what David says to God. 
sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened, burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. God is saying, I want you. I don't necessarily want your sacrifices. Certainly I don't want them if they're a substitute for a relationship with me, which is the way it often is. People will give something, put something in the church, um, you know, offering plate and think that they've done their duty before God and they're pleasing to God. He couldn't care less if he doesn't have you. Now, if he has you and you want to give to his work, well, that's a big deal because because God knows that you're given because you want to help get out his word or because you love Jesus and you want others to hear about him. Well, then, then that's a big deal to God, but it's not a substitute. And God is saying here, I want you more than I want your religious activity. Good works are great if they are the byproduct of a close walk with Jesus, but they are useless and pitiful if they are an attempt to be a substitute for a close walk with Jesus. They're worthless. Seven. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Stop right there for a second. And you know what this is? This is actually... Jesus. This is actually Jesus talking to the Father, as the New Testament makes clear. Sacrifice and offering never took away man's sins. Never. Not even in the Old Testament. It never did the job. They are not what God wanted. Nor were they valuable enough to pay for man's sin. The blood of bulls and goats, the, the New Testament says, could not pay for man's sin. How could they? A bull and a goat, sorry, Peter, a bull and a goat or a lamb or anything else, an animal is not as valuable as a human being. They're not valuable enough to pay for man's sin. You could offer a thousand of them, 10,000 of them, and they wouldn't pay for one single sin. God needed a sinless human being to die as a substitute for sinful human beings. Jesus qualified. Jesus volunteered to pay for our sins. And we should appreciate Christ because his death on the cross was not only sufficient, but it was completely and totally voluntary. If you can't think of another reason to praise Jesus, you can praise him that your sins are forgiven and that you're not going to burn in hell. Nine, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not restrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. Jesus preached righteousness. The apostles preached righteousness. And no preacher, no Bible teacher, no pastor is worth, worth the title unless they do the same, unless they preach righteousness, a hatred for sin, and on the positive side, righteousness, both. Most of modern evangelical preaching today is dictated by popular culture, not the righteousness of God. Most of it is aimed at making people feel good about themselves. Oh, maybe throwing in a little challenge every now and then, but very gently, ne ne never in a confrontational style like the Word of God is, so often? Never. Always got to water that down or ignore that completely. Most of it is aimed at making people feel good, feel comfortable, rather than making people feel good about Jesus. And by doing that, recognizing that you fall so fall short, far short of Jesus, that you need to lean on him and you need to pray and you need to be in his word 
and you need to confess your sin. 10. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. It is not enough to be saved from hell through Jesus Christ. The way of salvation must be shared with others. The truth of God's word must be shared with others. It was unthinkable that David would keep the great news of salvation to himself. Not helping to spread the word of Almighty God is one of the most selfish things that a Christian can do. I know that I'm far from perfect. Boy, I know that. You just talk to God about it sometime. Ask him to show you. But I, I love verse 10. This is written by a man who was far from perfect too, David. And the Apostle Paul said he was the chief of all sinners. So I guess he took first place. None of the rest of us are as bad, although I think I could give him a run for his money. But David writes, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great con congregation. And you know what? I'm glad that I can honestly say the same thing. And that's not bragging. The Apostle Paul said, I have not shrunk back from declaring unto you the whole counsel of God. And that's what David is saying. And I, I believe with all my heart I can say the same thing. In over 30 years of teaching the Word of God, I'm not saying I was always right. I'm not saying I never had to correct my former stands, my former teachings. I've had to do plenty of that, I'm sure. But I can tell you with a straight face before Almighty God that I have never watered down the Word of God. I have never calculated what I might say and how it might affect somebody, whether they would like it or not. I've never sat down and calculated that and let that influence what I say. There are plenty of times I knew things that I was going to say were going to rub some people the wrong way, but I said it. If it was the Word of God, I said it. I have never watered the Word of God down. And you know what? I've got 30 years. Everything that I've ever taught is for you to judge. It's out there in the open. It's in the public. You can disagree with me. You can disagree with some of the things that I believe. But no one can accuse me of watering down the Word of God or compromising for the sake of selfish gain or popularity or anything like that. Like I said, I've done a lot of terrible things in my life. I know I have. But that's one thing I haven't done. And David didn't either. And that's what he's talking about. Verse 11. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. Like with David, our hope is the love and the mercy, mercy and the faithfulness of God. That's where our hope is. That's where it should, that, that's the only legitimate hope that there is. If God withholds his great mercy, we are goners. 12. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore, my heart faileth me. Well, there's an honest self-evaluation. You say, David had a terrible self-image. Yeah, he sure did. Wasn't he honest? That's what you should have, a terrible self-image. That's what I should have, a terrible self. If you have anything other than a terrible self-image, you are living a lie. Well, that goes against what my psychologist tells me. That goes against what I've heard James Dobson say. Yeah. Well, their words aren't 
their words are worthless because it contradicts the word of God. God never tells us to cultivate a self-image, a good self-image. We are to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We are to keep our eyes on Jesus. We are to have a Christ esteem, not a self-esteem. So David says here in verse 12, For innumerable evils have come past me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me, so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore my heart faileth me. You say, David shouldn't have been talking that way. Because it does promote a bad self-image, and that's just a terrible thing to have. Oh, really? Then why did God say about David that David was a man after his own heart? Because David recognized his own wretchedness, and it humbled him before God, and it made him look to God for righteousness. It made him look to God for mercy and grace and blessing and not rely on himself. Peter had a great self-image. The Last Supper, oh, he had a wonderful self-image. I'll never deny you, <laughs> I'm too good for that. Look, I, I think highly, of, you don't think very highly of me, do you, Jesus? And Jesus could have said, no, I don't, Peter. But I sure am correct. And Peter had a fantastic self-image, and he went on and he denied Jesus three times. And David's problems are too big to handle. And by his own admission, his sins are too many to count. You see, the poor, pathetic human being. No, not really. Not really. The one to be pitied is he who doesn't realize that he's pathetic. The one to be pitied is the one who doesn't realize that he is a worthless sinner, according to Romans chapter 1. All of us have become altogether worthless. That's the one to be pitied, the one who doesn't realize that and doesn't realize that they're in trouble because of it. And their sins are too many to count. They're the ones that are to be petty because they don't cry out to God Almighty for mercy through Jesus Christ. And you know where they end up? Do I have to really tell you? I'll give you one guess. Write me and tell me if you, have the, if you think you have the right answer. Because that's exactly where they go. 13. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. In other words, please, Lord, come and save me now. And that is the fervent cry of a sinner who needs God's help and knows that he needs it. And that type of prayer, because it is sincere, will get a response from God. We'll pick it up right here in verse 14 next time. You can continue studying. We're out of time. But you can continue studying the Word of God at your pace, at your convenience, at the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at thebibleversebyverse.com. I hope you have a hunger for the Word of God. If you do, that's a place to satisfy it. You can stuff it. You can gorge yourself with the written Word of God, spiritual food, spiritual meat and potatoes at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if you don't have a hunger for the Word of God, go there and get a taste. Like the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And that hunger for God's Word will begin to grow. And it'll be the best thing that ever happened to you. Because we all need the Word of God. Study it at thebibleversebyverse.com, verse by verse. If you appreciate this ministry, if you appreciate, if you love the Word of God, and you like it straight, the blessing and the discomfort of it all, the rebuke, the encouragement, the teaching, the instruction, the correction, as God says a Bible teacher is supposed to do. If you like that and you appreciate that and you love the whole counsel of God, please consider supporting this ministry, becoming a partner with me. Stand with me shoulder to shoulder as we get out the Word of God. It's more important than ever. And you can give in a secure method at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click the donate button at the top of the front page and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Please pray for this ministry. And again, prayerfully 
Ask God what he would have you give. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. So long.